um, we will have our second presentation about the bus rapid transit or BRT for Cebu. Our second speaker has a Master of Engineering in Asian Institute of Technology in Bangkok, Thailand. He has a diploma in urban and regional planning from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. And he also has a Cambridge diploma in project management center for international education. He specializes in structural engineering and tr transportation engineering. He has undertaken various programs and projects under Cebu City, um, GTZ, ADB, SKI, the province of Cebu, and the World Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give a virtual round of applause for our second speaker, Engineer Nigel Paul C. Villarete. Good afternoon to everybody. Yeah, I, I was tasked to uh, present the uh, Cebu Bus Rapid Transit, uh, what it is, what is the status now. I think uh, this is something which is quite, quite different from the usual topics that we discuss in civil engineering. As we all uh, understand from the start, uh, uh, civil engineering has uh, many uh, sub-specializations. We have structural engineering, we have geotechnical, we have water, uh, transportation, construction, and other, other fields of uh, civil engineering. But if you look at the number of professionals that we have right now, in terms of how many civil engineers are into transportation, how many are into construction, how many are into design, and water, and everything else, we'll find out that the number of uh, people who are involved with transportation is actually quite low compared to the other uh, subfields of specialization. However, uh, the reason for this also is because transportation by itself is not is, is unlike the other fields which are uh, almost purely civil engineering. If you go to construction, maybe you can find some architects there, but you cannot find uh, uh, many non-engineers in, in those fields. If you go to uh, even uh, water uh, engineering, still it's mostly engineering per se. But in transportation engineering, there are other uh, professional sir, disciplines that are... Sorry, Sir Paul. Um, yes? Can you share your screen, please? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Later. So, so uh, this is quite unique. Uh, I'll share it now. now. This is quite unique. Uh, and so, I'm, I'm glad that uh, I was asked to present this. Uh, I would be. I, I did not know what really, what aspects really uh, would would the uh, participants want to know more on uh, Cebu bus rapid transit. So I'll make two presentations. The first is the Cebu BRT itself. What it is. What uh, what it is now. Uh, how did it evolve throughout the years? And secondly, I will present, of course, the the background behind the BRT, uh, particularly on the choice. No. Uh, bus rapid transit is not something which we learned some sometime in 1980s and 1970s. In fact, when I finished my civil engineering in 1983, uh, we did not we did not study about uh, buses for mass transportation. I can remember that uh, it was discussed very briefly, but the professor then said that uh, well, there are many instances for rail all over the world. There is none for bus rapid or, or bus-based uh, mass transportation. Of course, we have ordinary buses, but these are not considered really mass transportation in the particular sense of transit. Uh, it, it was only in 1974 that the first BRT was implemented in Curitiba. And uh, for so many years and decades, uh, nobody followed, followed the, the example of Curitiba until uh, in two, the year 2000 in Bogota, Colombia, uh, through uh, Mayor, uh, uh, this? Is, uh, Espinosa, uh, built the, tran, uh, the, the, the transit, no? the BRT in, in Colombia. And more recently, there are many BRTs that are built all, of, all over the world, but still there are a lot of myths, there are a lot of uh, misinformation. And even among civil engineers, there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding with regards to 
bus rapid transit, uh, most especially in terms of uh, propriety, in terms of how it will affect uh, urban cities, and in terms of how it will actually translate to uh, the, the distribution of, of transport between rail, between uh, private vehicles, and between uh, uh, other modes of transport. So I will try to address that at a later part of the presentation. But I will start first with presenting what uh, Cebu Bus Rapid Transit is no? as, a, as a start. OK, just a description. Uh, this, the BRT for Cebu was originally planned back in 2010 from Bulacao, Bulacao up to Talamban. You can see the route. It will pass through, Osman, uh, it will pass through Natalio Bacalso. It will go to Osmania Boulevard. Is carried and it will go to, of course, uh, uh, Governor Cuenco Avenue, Talamban Road, or Manila Road, up to Talamban. So that was the original road in year 2000. The funding source is actually from the World Bank. Uh, total cost is actually originally at nine or approximately 10 billion pesos. And this was increased in, nine, in 2017 to 16 billion pesos. Of course, the increase here, 10 years or a few years after the approval, is not mainly in the infrastructure itself, but in the cost of land. This is because in 2016, there was a law which was passed uh, called the ROW law, which actually allows uh, government to buy or forces government to offer market prices for ROW. So that's the reason why uh, it increased from 10 billion to 16 billion. Uh, very briefly, uh, BRT is uh, high quality bus based transit, delivers fast, comfortable, cost effective urban mobility through the provision of segregated right of way infrastructure. I think the, the important uh, phrases here are segregated right of way infrastructure. So this means that this is not the ordinary bus that you see in the streets, this is not the buses that you see in Manila right now or any other city in the world. Uh, when it starts going to be segregated and you have stations and you have uh, services which are actually uh, the frequency is every five minutes, every 10 minutes, unlike our buses now, then that is approaching what we call uh, BRT. As, uh, the BRT, of course, will provide quality uh, orient, uh, transit to Cebu. No? Just like to state here, because I've lived in Cebu for a long time, ever since I graduated from college, that Cebu is a peculiar case uh, in the sense that we are, we, we, we failed to upgrade our uh, mass transport system from the very start. No? Unlike Manila, when they have jeepneys, then they went up to buses, then they went to the LRTs. Cebu has been using uh, jeepneys until this time. We never jumped to buses, which actually uh, allows us to reconsider at this point in time to go into transit. The jeepneys will stay. The jeepneys will still continue to serve the, the Cebuanos, but it's about time that we jump into higher modes of transportation. And transportation is here, we call that shifting, to shift to, to higher capacity transportation in terms of which I will discuss later in terms of capacity per hour. In other words, what the transportation system should be able to, to, to move so many thousands of people per hour as compared to the previous form of transportation. Okay, this is very important because <coughs> this defines this defines what a BRT is as compared to the other forms of transportation. The BRT has the following components. First, you will have segregated median busway. Now, the median here is the usual because there are BRTs which are we call what we call bilateral, meaning the lanes are on the on both sides of the road, on the extreme sides of the road. But I think uh, 80 to 90 percent of the BRTs in the world are median. We meaning that the all the busways are in the center of the of the road, and so are the uh, stations. Of course, there are uh, cases where uh, there are mixed cases. There are BRTs that have median lanes and median stations. But at, at the end of the line, they allow the buses to go out of the, of the median stations and then they will regularly drop off passengers on the side of the road. But most, if not all, most of the BRTs are actually median, median segregated bus lanes. Then you have a station. This is very important. 
if you don't see a station, that's not a BRT because it cannot provide a uh, frequency that is uh, required by the BRT. You have single median station, you have clean, clean technology, which is new, passing lanes, which allow for express lanes. Then you have universal access, meaning uh, in, in, in an ordinary bus or ordinary jeepney, you cannot allow people on wheelchair to access the bus. Here, because you have a platform, the stations have a platform which is on the same level as the bus, then you can actually have uh, uh, wheelchairs go inside the bus. That is the advantage of uh, BRTs. No? Then your fare collection also is different. Your fare collection is not on board. There are two kinds of fare collection. There's on-board fare collection and off-board fare collection. BRTs like LRTs, like uh, subways, like uh, MRTs, they are uh, pre-board fare collection. That is off-board. You buy your fare uh, or tickets outside the bus. You go inside the bus already with a ticket. So examples of BRTs in Abinabad in India, Guangzhou, which is the second biggest BRT in the world, about 30,000 passengers per hour per, uh, per, per direction. Bangkok has a BRT, Seoul has a BRT. And of course, uh, well, the first BRT in Asia is in Jakarta. This has helped Jakarta a lot uh, uh, when they started this after Bogota. <clears throat> so Cebu BRT will start with the, uh, uh, when it started, it has a projected ridership of 330 passengers per day, which is approximately what we have now. Uh, total total uh, distance from Bulacao to Ayala is uh, 23 kilometers. 15 kilometers of it are segregated, and 8 kilometers from Ayala to Talamban is unsegregated. As I uh, said before, uh, there are times that uh, you have a mixed BRT, and this is one of the mixed BRT. You have 15 percent, uh, 15 kilometers of segregated bus lanes, but the last 8 kilometers to Talamban is mixed meaning it mixed with the traffic. However, this is just temporary because the plan was to make this segregated uh, after some time. The reason why this was planned as unsegregated at first is because it's really very difficult to get road right away in Talamban. So, but I think in terms of planning, for planning purposes within the next 10 years, once the BRT will be on board, this will be upgraded into a segregated bus lanes with other uh, bus lanes will be built all over the city. We have 23 uh, BRT stations, which uh, will show you that approximately is about one kilometer or less, because there are stations which are very far away, uh, around less than a kilometer per between stations. Uh, it was expected. It's expected to. Wow, I finished yeah, my test. It's expected to. Uh, uh, start in uh, 2020, but I doubt if it can. Uh, most probably it will start in end of 2021 or 2022. Again, the, the uh, cost is 16 billion, financing is World Bank and AFD, and this is very important. The EIRR for this project is 53%. For those who are familiar with uh, making uh, feasibility studies or familiar with this, this is a very, very high EIRR. It means, it means that even if the BRT will, will cost 10 times more, it is still feasible. That is what we mean by this. It is so feasible that even if you uh, multiply the cost by 10, it is still feasible. Now let's differentiate this from financial IRR which is actually the profitability of a certain project to the private sector. But to the government, EIR is very high. Uh, very quickly, uh, this is uh, SIT now, before construction. After you construct the BRT and the station, this is will, SIT will look like this. This will be uh, SIT before construction. After construction, SIT will look like this. So you will have six lanes here, six lanes you will retain this will become eight lanes plus uh, two lanes, uh, plus one lane at both sides. And then you will have, of course, the, the lanes are actually <coughs> narrower here. Then you will have two lanes here for, uh, to have a passing lane. And you will have the, the two lanes for mixed traffic. At Oiting So in Osmania uh, uh, Boulevard, this will be, of course, the existing median 
this will become the station at uh, Oiting. So I think in front of Normal College. Then after construction, it will, it will look like this for Oiting. So. Now let's look at the uh, PRT standard cross-section. If you look at the this one, this is six lanes, and you will have the BRT actually has a, uh, has a narrower lane than the ordinary car. So this is for uh, six lanes, four lane section. For, for form two, again, the, uh, the uh, BRT lane is actually narrower than the car lane. And uh, there are many ways of separating the BRT lanes from the rest of the mixed lanes. Uh, you can actually just put something like this, or you can actually put barriers, no? It really depends on how uh, the, the people in the particular city uh, behaves, no? In some cities, this will suffice, but probably in Philippine cities, people will just cross the road. And that's the reason why, probably in the Philippines, there will be a higher barrier when you build BRTs in the Philippines. Design for the BRT, uh, the, the important thing in the BRT is that the design of the road is, of course, uh, as we have presented before, but you have the, the important thing in the, in the BRT are the stations. I will explain that in the second presentation, why the stations are actually very, very important. Okay, this is a station with three buses that, that can accommodate three buses. This is a station that can accommodate only two, and this can accommodate on both sides, uh, three buses. Okay, as per the APS, uh, the AM peak is 55 times and 45 times. And let's look at the standard uh, uh, station design. Uh, you will have facilities for the, for the wheelchair to go inside the station so that actually you will have uh, disabled persons or people with disabilities, they can use the PRT. Yeah? And this is the the station, uh, how the station looks. Now, the main question that the BRT people or uh, critics or you know observers really ask is how will the how will the uh, people go in the station if the station is in the middle of the road? Uh, they will have access, which is actually uh, uh, using uh, skywalks, no skywalks here. But in certain areas in the world, they only they only use uh, pedestrian lanes. No? And people were asking, how is that? How will you use pedestrian lanes to cross to the BRT station if there are, there are uh, uh, traffic in the, in the remaining lanes? Well, the answer to that is, you know, <clears throat> the, the headway for BRTs are really very, very short. In other words, you can use the, the uh, signal system of the existing road to use that to, use that to allow people to cross. And that will suffice in so far as headways are concerned. Headways for BRT is very, very small. It's only about what, uh, 10, 10 seconds in the, in the stations. You can have a headway of 30 seconds. Headway uh, dwell time in the station is 10 seconds. This is San Jose station. This is a uh, SAT station. And this is Birama Station. Again, you see that these are the ways that they can actually cross and go inside the BRT station. This is a standard uh, BRT cross section for the station, seven to eight, seven to eight uh, 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 locations. There are different locations of the 23 station and different designs for each, wherever it is, it is fitted. This is symmetrical station, meaning the station looks the same from both sides, from this, uh, this direction to this direction. We also ha have what we call an asymmetrical station, in which, in which case uh, they are actually separated. The two stations, the, the incoming station from the left, is separate from the incoming station from the, from the right. Of course, there is always a, a crossing there so that people can go from the one, sta one part of the station to the other. Again, an another part of a uh, asymmetrical station, so that you can you can actually go from one station to the other, and the and the 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 buses will actually have their their uh, doors on the right side. Okay, this is the main difference between buses. 
the BRT buses and the ordinary buses. The buses have doors on the right side, unless our, our ordinary bus, the bus have uh, uh, doors on the, on, the, on the left side. Okay, the standard cross section for four lanes is least, so we will have actually only two lanes for mixed traffic. For six, six, six lane sections, we have two lanes for mixed traffic. The rest will be for BRT lane. Design for pavement and drainage, of course, it will be the same as ordinary road sections. Then we will have at specific, specific uh, station, we will have transfer stations. Uh, we will have, we will, I will discuss it at the later part, that actually the BRT will not totally erase the jeepney. The BRT will not, will not uh, replace the jeepney. The BRT cannot work without the jeepney. Because we are looking here at shifting from higher to higher modes of transportation. We still need the lower modes of transportation for the hierarchical, hierarchical differences in, in terms of uh, uh, capacity, in terms of uh, the demand and, uh, and supply. So there must be some, some uh, feeder. The feeders here are the, the existing jeepneys. Packaging, uh, package one, this is in terms of uh, uh, building it. There will be package one uh, to package six from Bulacao to Talamban uh, as original design because of the later portion I'll, I'll show you that uh, in last year, they have actually uh, cut the design by 50%. So what we have now being constructed is only 50% of what of this one, of the original uh, design that was uh, uh, approved back in 2014. So this is the, the, how the station will look like. And I will show you uh, examples of station. This is a symmetrical type in front of BSIT. This is how, if you look at, if you look at BRTs, the BRTs actually do not have some sort of terminals or uh, very elaborate stations. No? It can be as simple as, as this. No? For as long as you have an area that you can, uh, you can have people stay until the next bus now. Depends on how, 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 how many buses will pass per, per 10 seconds or per 30 seconds. That will be the, the volume or the capacity of this station. Take note that the, the concept of BRT is not to have uh, passengers stay in the station without catching the first bus. In other words, correctly designed, you should be able to take your, take your ride with the first or the second bus that pass through the station. That is how it is designed in terms of capacity. This will be, uh, again, SIT. Asymmetrical is like this. Uh, uh, you will have one station going, going uh, uh, to, the, to the other direction and another station going to the other direction. And this, will, this is how it will look at night. Okay, and San Carlos University, this is the station that, uh, uh, it's just an ordinary station. You don't really need an elaborate, elaborate station uh, for BRTs, no? Of course, when you have a high volume, high volume uh, uh, station like the one in SRP, or high volume station in Ayala, or uh, I think in IT Park, then you do need uh, a bigger station, and in fact, uh, the concept really is, uh, if you are going to have to end up in a mall, it's usually the station inside the mall. You can try to build the station inside the mall. <coughs> okay, service plan. This is uh, very important in terms of understanding the difference between BRT and LRT, uh, MRT, and uh, uh, metros. If you, if you look at uh, LRT in Manila, you have LRT from Monumento to TAF originally. So basically you have only one <coughs> route. You have one route from M Monumento to, to uh, uh, TAF Avenue and TAF Avenue back to Monumento. But when you have a BRT, you can actually have, in this case, eight routes. You can have eight routes using the same infrastructure. In other words, it depends on the demand. Because actually, when you have a linear, you have a linear uh, uh, system like uh, rail. Uh, it's always from end to end. Uh, it's very seldom that you have 
uh, or that that sometimes happen, but it's very seldom that you have a train that that only ends at the at the in the middle. Usually, it's from end to end. Even if you go to Singapore or the bigger cities in the world, it's always end to end. But in BRT, you can actually have this one. Like for example, the blue one, the dark blue is Bulacao to Ayala. This Bulacao to Ayala. The yellow one is Bulacao to IT Park. The the green one is Bulacao direct to Talamban, and so on and so forth. You have a Ayala go to SRP. Then you have SRP go to Talamban. You have Talamban which goes to SRP. You have eight service plans. Now the service plans are designed depending on the demand of the passengers, and the service plan can change. That's the reason why we have service plans because you know the flow of passengers is different in the morning, in the afternoon, in the middle of the day, in midday, between morning and lunch time. Lunch time they change, and that's why you have you have the service plans. This is the flexibility of the BRT compared to the rail kind of transit. In BRT, you can actually uh, have different service plans, and you can change the service plan very easily. In other words, after five years, if there's a change in, uh, for example, uh, uh, SRP withdraw so much that it needs more uh, vehicles that, that go to SRP, and then Talamban will go so much, then you can change the service plans. Uh, which is quite difficult if you do that with, with rail. Again, uh, as I said before, these are the new role for the jeepney. Uh, these are just the jeepney stations or jeepney transfer points. In other words, at every, at every station, uh, there is expected to be some jeepneys that pass by so that there will be some transfers. Note that the, the BRT is actually uh, you know, a spine it will not serve the entire city. That's why there's, there should not be any argument between the G, BRT and the Jeepney. At, at this point in time, uh, of course, uh, we have to, we have to uh, uh, consider uh, and we have to plan for the Jeepneys, how, the, how to transform them, how to uh, shift them to other uh, employment. Uh, uh, and, and, they will not, and they will not totally replace because there are other areas that, are, that cannot be reached by the, by the BRT. And that's why uh, there's a new role, role for them. It's actually a symbiotic relationship. And uh, our expectation is that there will be no job that will be uh, severed because of this, because jobs will also be created by the BRT. And uh, it's, it's, it's a matter of trying to go and uh, talk to the people, talk to the drivers and operators on how they can be assimilated to the BRT system. So at this point in time, I'm going to shift to the next PowerPoint. This is the reason why we built the uh, BRT. I will have to explain this in terms of land use, and I'm very sorry that uh, we ha I have to integrate uh, urban planning here because, as you know, uh, transportation and urban planning cannot be separated. Uh, you cannot plan for transport if you do not plan for land use. Uh, vice versa, vice versa. You cannot plan for land use if you don't plan for for transportation. I'll, since we are we are in the Cebu chapter, I'd like to make a specific uh, discussion on Cebu. Uh, we suppose this is the situation in suppose we plan. This is not true. This is not this is not the re, the reality. But suppose we plan that that everybody, all of us, all the two million people in the, in Metro Cebu, will live in Talisay. This is just a supposition. This is just a you know suppose that's 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 what happened. We live in Talisay, and then all of us will work in Mandawe. And then Cebu City is a commercial area. So this is industrial area, we work there. And this is Lapu-Lapu -Lapu -Lapu City, which is recreational. There's two million people in, Cebu, in Metro Cebu. So every day, Monday to Friday, all the two million people will travel up to Mandawe City to work. In the afternoon, all the 2 million people will travel from Mandawe City to Talisay, passing through Cebu City and maybe pass through the malls and all the commercial centers. 
all the 20 million people. And then on Saturdays and Sundays, recreation, all the 2 million people will go to Lapu Lapu City. Okay? That is not the case. It's, it's, it's uh, mixed use. But if we go back, if we go back here, we, you will see that you have to build a transportation system that can actually carry 2 million people. That is your demand, 2 million people, because there are 2 million people who will, who will uh, actually uh, 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 travel every day. But if we are going to go into mixed use, now supposing on the other extreme, we say that, okay, uh, Talisay City will have all the residential, commercial, and industrial, and recreational uses. Cebu City will have also residential, commercial, industrial, and recreational uses. So, are, so will uh, Mandawi and Lapu-Lapu City. So theoretically, it will, it will, uh, we can follow that, you know, there's no need for people from Talisay to go to Cebu City. There's no need from, for people from Lapu-Lapu to go to Cebu City or for Talise to go to Lapu-Lapu City. Of course, that's the other extreme, no? I'm just trying to, be, to look at the extreme here. What we're saying here is that the kind of land use that we, we adopt will affect our transport system. And the, the kind of transport system that we build will affect our land use. If we build eight uh, expressways from Talise to Lapu-Lapu, Everybody will just live anywhere and just be. Hey, there's a good transportation system, but then again, you will build you will build eight bridges between Lapu-Lapu and, and the mainland. So that's what we are saying that traffic mobility and accessibility will depend upon mixed land uses and land use planning and transportation planning cannot be separated from each other. Uh, the other the other thing that of course many of us uh, who are civil engineers, uh, many of us know this. When we zone, we have residential zone, resi uh, we have uh, light residential, heavy residential, we have office, office retail. These are the old school. Okay? We learned this in 1970s and learned this in 1980s, but actually this produces a real difficulty in terms of transportation. What is being promoted now is multi-zone. In other words, we should have zones that are micro zones. In every area, you should have, for example, you have a residential area, you must have a small commercial area there, you must have a small, uh, you must have your schools there, you must have your, your medical facilities there, so that you don't go, you know, you don't have uh, people living in Talamban and they go, go to school in UC in the center of the city. That's, that's the, the difficulty here. Uh, land use and transportation, uh, these are the different urban uh, spatial uh, structures. So the city will have different transport system depending on what urban spatial structure it does. However, this is long term. This, this happened in the next 50 years. So we cannot change whatever we have now. This is just a background of why we are like we are today. Uh, just to show you uh, that Always the cities will have concentration of population in the center. This is Jakarta, and you have this. This is Shanghai, and you will have this. Uh, most, uh, there are a few cities that are actually e even. You know? London is quite even. Uh, uh, Berlin is quite even. And of course, uh, Paris is quite even. But most of the cities, including Manila and Cebu, are actually having this kind of land use patterns. Okay, same. You can see here the difference between Lisbon, okay, and uh, Brasilia, and Curitiba. Curitiba is a flat country, and that's why the mass transport is very, very good. And this is the difference between London and Jakarta. This is a low density or medium density. You have Jakarta, which is very, very high density in the center and very low density outside. Unfortunately, our Philippine cities, including Metro Manila and Metro Cebu, will, are actually looking like this. And this is very, very difficult for transport. Now, uh, just a caution. The one that is causing our, our traffic problems is actually this. Low density car-oriented development. All of these subdivisions are the ones that are causing our traffic problems.
problems, not only in Metro Cebu, but all over the country. Because of this, you have to build all of these expressways that are there in Manila. The Metro Manila is actually crisscross expressways. And now we are building, again, expressways in, in Cebu. No? This is the result of a high car transport demand. Later on, we will have to discuss why it's really not a good idea to have a, a demand for transport like this. Okay, transport and energy demand. This just to show you, <clears throat> I don't know if it's very, very clear. This, this axis is actually urban density in terms of inhabitants per hectare. So you can see that uh, Hong Kong is very, very dense. Then you have the American cities that are not actually dense. Houston, Phoenix, Detroit, uh, Denver, and Los Angeles, and all of these, they are not dense. They are very, very flat. Those of you who went to the U.S., you can see that you can sell them unless you are in the center of the city. All the, all the buildings there are one story, two stories. You cannot see three stories or four stories. It's always one story, very flat. You go to the cities in the U.S., they're very flat, except for the center. But in, if you go to Hong Kong, it's very, very tall, tall buildings all around, even in the seemingly rural areas. Then you have this curve. These are the other cities here. These are the cities in Australia. These are the cities in Europe. And you can see that actually, to, 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 to our surprise, actually the better cities in terms of energy demand, sorry, energy demand, are actually the Asian cities, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Tokyo. And of course, uh, other cities in, in, in uh, other dense cities in, uh, uh, in, in Asia. But of course, uh, Philippines, I think somewhere, still somewhere here, we have not been so dense, dense but uh, very low in transport demand. Meaning you are dense, but you have very effective mass transport system. So mobility and accessibility is uh, <coughs> affected. If you, have, if you have a development like this, and we have, some, we have plenty of this in Metro Cebu and other cities in the Philippines, these are the usual, the usual housing that we have, middle-class housing, which if you look at this, this housing development invites everybody to buy a car. If you go to the cities of Europe uh, and the parts of, and you go to uh, uh, Japan or Hong Kong or Singapore, people don't necessarily buy cars, okay? But in the Philippines, you're forced to buy a car because if you live in one of these subdivisions, there's no way for you to go to work if you don't have a car, or at least a motorcycle. So this is an invitation for traffic congestion. Uh, most of our housing now are actually uh, well, single story or uh, two stories affairs. It's not uh, as high as it's not as high as the other Asian cities. Now I would just like to show you this particular. Uh, this is uh, Deca Homes in uh, Lapu Lapu City. As you can see, it's uh, of course this is two story. These are one story affairs, but these are dense. You cannot live in this area because there's no jeepney going inside. You cannot live here if you don't have a car. You cannot live here if you don't have a car. This is an invitation uh, for you to buy cars and for the cars to cause traffic. If you look at the density of this one, and these are new in the last 10 years, these subdivision shares were not here in the last 10 years. So because these are new, uh, there's reason to believe that these new subdivisions in Mactan are the ones that are causing the traffic in Mactan Mandawi bridges. This is a uh, picture of, uh, uh, in 2009, of Basak Lapu Lapu City. Look at this. This Basak Lapu Lapu City, 2009. 10 years after, this becomes this. Okay? This is 2009, after 10, 10 years, become this. Now you compute how many cars evolved from this kind of development. That is the car, uh, the car uh, induced, the car uh, uh, defined development. So what's the government's main goal as far as mobility is concerned? Is it to prevent traffic? Is it to reduce traffic? Is it to eliminate traffic? Is it to manage traffic? So this, these are the things that we ask. What do government, uh, what should government do? prevent traffic, reduce traffic, eliminate traffic, or manage traffic. The key points that we have to understand why we develop things, even government or private sector, 
that man is the center of development. At a later stage, I would like to show you that sometimes we are not, even civil engineers, we're not looking at man at the center of development. Uh, sorry to say that, that is really something that we often forget. No? We are mesmerized by our buildings, mesmerized by our infrastructure, bridges, that we forget that, that the, at the end, uh, our profession uh, is actually geared towards the development of man, man himself. Traffic congestion is a waste. So any traffic increased traffic congestion is always a waste. You cannot make the only the only person who makes money out of traffic congestion are actually the drivers of jeepneys and public transportation. They are the only ones earning from it. But all other people, they, this is a waste. Every minute, every second that you are in a traffic congested uh, roadway, that is a waste of productivity. In a democracy, all men are equal. In other words, we build, civil engineers build for all. We don't build for certain sectors, and definitely we should not be built for rich people only. We should build for everybody. In fact, I dare say, and it's my own personal mantra, that we have to build more for those who are less in life. In other words, even if we are looking at all men uh, created equal, we should always look at the difficulties of the, those who are uh, having, having difficulties, of course and do things for them so that it will make it easy for them to to you know upgrade their uh their life each filipino deserves the same there should not be any filipino that deserves more than others so the goal and purpose of government in transport and mobility is to ensure that each and every filipino can go to their places of productive economic work from their places of residence in the most reasonable period of time safe travel is safe comfortable, affordable, convenient, efficient, and preferably enjoyable. How do we do this? Now, we cannot talk about this. This is how our Philippine cities, or especially Metro Manila, looks now. Even in Cebu, this is happening now. If you go from one end to the other, it will take you an hour at least, or two hours uh, during peak hours. So this is where we are going, and there's really very, it's really very difficult to, to solve this kind of problem because sometimes we are not looking at how we compute we are looking not looking at man but we're looking at all of those cars that are scattered here no? we compute all of this and we say ah this is now then we project this is will be here and then we you make a line and this is this is our development we build infrastructure that's going up that is not the case we have to build for man not for cars these are the people that we have to build for, not for cars. We should be really talking about this. These are the people who are waiting in the streets every morning. If you go to Bulacao, Pardo area, Basak, Mambaling, even near, near uh, CIT, if you go to Talamban, Banilad, these are the people that are, you can see on the streets. So definitely we know that there is a problem. And you can see these problems are in the outlier areas since we are since these goals are mostly probably almost impossible to attain we cannot we cannot actually solve the problem by giving each person a right in other words there is really difficulty in in a situation in in humanity in in the society it's really difficult to please all the people in other words you cannot build for everybody okay so the, the, the mantra should be, it should be the greatest good for the most number. It should not be for a certain sector or a certain sector or only this, this small. It should be the greatest good for the most number because we cannot, it's really difficult to attain 100% perfection or 100% service. Greatest good for the most number while, while we do that because there are certainly, we minimize those who have, will be left behind and then we put safety nets so that there will be no one left behind. So again, the greatest good for the most number and there are safety nets for those, those who are left behind. In terms of metrics, and this is how we are supposed to, to discuss now, how do we measure these things? Okay, right now the metric, 
which DOTR, Department of Transportation, is measuring success is the speed of vehicles along EDSA. You can remember this, I think, a few months ago that they are saying that, you know, they're going to build infrastructure along EDSA so that you can have, <coughs> you can have uh, five minutes between Makati to, to Quezon City. That's the target. The speed of vehicles along EDSA. We have to change that metric from vehicle speed to number of people move going to create the biggest impact. In other words, again, the, uh, the, the, one that we, the, we, the one that we have to shift our thoughts on, our ideas on, is, is always to shift from the vehicle towards people. Now, this is a little bit different because in our training, uh, usually when we discuss this in, in civil engineering before, we always look at, and even in the DPWH uh, um, planning manual, we always, we always measure the number of vehicles. It's always uh, to what, what is the capacity of the road? 200 vehicles or PCO per hour. Or what is that per day? That is the capacity of the second uh, Mactan Mandawe Bridge. That's the capacity of the third Mactan Mandawe Bridge without measuring how many people are inside those vehicles. So right now we have to shift our, our uh, planning uh, designs our planning parameters away from vehicles into, we don't forget the vehicles, of course, because that is needed in terms of um, technical design, but we have to look at how do, we, how do we move the people, the most number of people from one place to another so that they can go from their places of work or to, from their places of residence to their places of work. If you look at the trip purpose distribution, you can see that there are so many so many distribution of employers, business, medical, these are the number of trips that you do per day. And you can see that half of those trips is returning to the house. That is correct because, you know, you only go out of the house once, you always go to the, to the house after you finish your trip. Or if you go out twice, you go home twice. Then this is the, the other end is mostly in about 37% is mostly on work and school. That is the other end of the trip. The others are mainly 1.1, 5.4 for shopping, and so on and so forth. But majority of our trips, in fact, more than 50% or 60% of our, of our trips are really home-to-work trips. Now, these are the, the uh, public utility vehicle routes in Metro Cebu with the highest load factor. As you can see, there are actually <clears throat> uh, one, a single heavy north-south north -south, uh, route, which is very heavy. And then there is a heavy central to Talamban corridor. So there is one main corridor from north to south. There is a corridor that goes to Talamban. Then there's another corridor that goes to Mactan. Uh, this one is being assisted now once the uh, CCLX will be completed there will be another corridor that will pass through here in fact once this CCLX will be completed uh, I think in 2022 and it reaches here there is a proposal now for another uh, expressway that will connect CCLX to the airport and then connect this to the bridges so that it can continue up to the north when that happens, they will have a three corridor system for Metro Cebu because right now we only have a two corridor system. The public main corridor, which is passing to Natalio Bocalso and it passes to MJ Cuenco and the, uh, what we call the coastal uh, corridor, which passes through the SRP and so on to the Mandawi Reclamation. These are the two corridors and the third one will be the one that will be using the CCLEX, then the connection to the to the north of Mactan and henceforth to the north of Cebu. This can be calculated. In other words, that's, that's, that's why we have uh, traffic engineering, we have transport planning. This can be cal calculated. This is the, the number of trips that will occur, that have occurred in 2017. As you can see, 1 to 14 are actually the municipalities and cities in Metro Cebu. And, uh, this is origin destination table, and you will have 
you will have uh, six is actually Lapu Lapu, seven is Manawe, eight is Cebu. And you can see that Cebu City has the highest, highest uh, central, uh, highest central uh, trips, followed by Lapu Lapu. The three cities constitute 70% of the traffic. In other words, there is a supply and demand which can be calculated. And this can be calculated in terms of uh, uh, what it will be in 2030, what it will be in 2050. That's how we plan. We know these are the number of trips. How do we provide the transport system that can carry all of these trips? Now, this is the 2050 demand. And if you can take a look at that, this is the demand in, uh, in 2017. This is the demand in 2030. Of course, there will be there will be congestion in all the other municipalities, but as you can see, it's really very congested in Metro Cebu, the three cities. So how do we, how do we now <coughs> uh, provide the infrastructure? Do we build more roads? Take note that for every road that we build, for every ex expansion that we build, we are actually cutting away a certain area of the city because you're cutting it away. You cannot, you cannot build unless you are going to build Again, uh, overpasses which so many many people in in Cebu do not want. But if you do that, uh, there will be we will run out of space uh, sooner or later. So this is this is how we look at this. Okay, just uh, zeroing in on the three cities. This is Lapu Lapu. Uh, Lapu Lapu, by the way, is already the second biggest city in terms of population in terms of trips. It has surpassed uh, Mandawi a few years back. Lapu Lapu is only the second to Cebu City in terms of number of trips. Okay, our design capacity supply must be more than or equal to capacity demand. I think that's that's uh, uh, understandable enough. But you have to look at the capacities. There are two kinds of capacities here: capacity of the road and capacity of the vehicle. If you have one train, and I'm looking at a train, a metro train. A train that goes from uh, that a train that is in Singapore or in Hong Kong or in Tokyo, we can carry 1,000 people. Okay, so why you have one eight carriages can carry 1,000 people? The one in Manila, LRT and MRT, they carry only about 400 people because they have just uh, eight carriages uh, each. No, it's train. But there is one, the metros, the big metros in New York, Paris, London. Uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, they can carry 1,000 people. You have ordinary buses, okay? This, this can be carried, 1,000 people can be carried by 15 buses or even 10 buses if you have a 18-meter uh, bus. And it can be carried by 200 to 1,000 cars, anywhere from 200 to 1,000 cars, depending on whether you each car will carry only the driver or th with three passengers. Okay, so as you can see, the, the, the transport capacity, the moving capacity is different from the vehicle capacity. If we have, all of us will have cars, definitely there will be traffic and we cannot move from here or from Cebu City up to Lapu Lapu City, uh, even in one day, if all of us will have cars. So it, there, <clears throat> there, should be, there should be a plan on how to segregate and which to plan. Do we plan for cars or we plan for buses? We plan for rail. That is now the, the question. If you look at this capacity, the bus is uh, in square foot per person. Uh, pedestrians is 10 square foot per person. Bike is 15 square foot per person. And this is the car, whether it's Uber or electric or autonomous or ordinary car, this is the space per person. This is very familiar to most of us and just uh, defining what is the road space required for uh, I think 80, 80 uh, persons. If you have to move 80 persons, you will have this road space if everybody will take one car each. You will have this road space if everybody will go by bike and you will have this road space if everybody will go by bus. So how do we now design the road? Of course, when you design the road, anybody can pass through the road. This is just a precursor to the rationally why we go into rail or we go into uh, BRT, which we consider as mass transport. 
just a, a look at how the how the different different uh, vehicles will actually carry people. All the cars will carry one or two passengers, and there are many of them. There are many who carry their walking, and there are many who have one, one passengers. Then you have vans which will carry uh, 20. There's 28. What else? Then you have the buses. These are the BRT buses that can carry 107, 93, 134. That will show you this disparity of the, the capacity, the capacity of mass transport as compared to, to ordinary cars. And let's go back to <coughs> BRT. Okay. Uh, these are the parts of the BRT. Uh, this is very important. Now, for a very shortly, I'm going to explain why the station is very important. When you have a bus in EDSA, or even maybe a bus in, a, in, a, in a Cebu, well, let's look at EDSA. You look at a bus in EDSA from, from uh, TAF going to Monumento. If you look at the total time the bus will traverse the, the, from, from the beginning, from the origin to destination, you will find out that the time for passengers to get down and board the bus is actually higher than the time for the bus to move. In other words, when a bus goes down in a specific loading and loading area, what do you see? A bus which actually have only, you know, uh, sometimes one door at the front, or maybe two doors, one in the front, one in the, at the back. And then you have the passengers lining up, going down one after the other. And then if there are 15 passengers who go down, they have to go down. Then that's the time that maybe another 10 passengers will go up. How many seconds do you think is lost in that loading and loading? And when you total this, for every loading and unloading, uh, section. Take note, the speed of the bus is actually very fast. Bus can, can go up to 60 kilometers per hour, it might be 45 kilometers per hour, or even 30 kilometers per hour. But the time that it spends on the loading and unloading station is so, is so high that the total time it takes to load and unload passengers is actually higher than the time for the bus to actually traverse the entire, the entire uh, uh, length of the uh, origin destination. If, to, if you measure that. And that's why, that's why it's very important that you have a station because in a BRT station, the bus itself is designed such that you will have three, two or three doors, sliding doors that are very wide. And then you have, you have passengers that are already in the station. The bus comes in, opens the door, everybody gets out, everybody gets in, and then the bus uh, speeds up all in 10 seconds. In other words, for this, for this case, the, uh, the uh, dwell time of the bus is actually 10 seconds. It will just stay in the, the station for 10 seconds. If you don't have this kind of, uh, the, this kind of design, you cannot have the, the capacity of the uh, BRT, which actually approaches uh, uh, LRT and even exceeds uh, LRT. As of this time, as of this time, the, uh, the, the, the design of the Cebu BRT is actually the same capacity as the LRT in Manila. In other words, uh, it can carry, well, before the pandemic, it can carry about 14,000 passengers per hour per direction. That's a bus compared to the LRT. If you put up some, uh, on the side of the road, if you put up express lanes, you can actually double the capacity because there are buses that go uh, pass through some of the some of the stations and go go through okay again i'll show you that this is the reason why we have stations the, the station design is very important because you must have the station in such a way that the dwell time of the brt is at its minimum probably from 10 to 15 uh 10 to 15 seconds Example, again, just showing back the design uh, to enable uh, dwell time of 15 to this one. These are actually sliding doors, which actually like in, your, like in an elevator and like in the LRT, it coincides with the sliding door of the, of the bus and they open together. Then passengers come out, passengers go in, and then the bus speeds, speeds off. 
that actually cuts the loading and loading time. We go back to, to this. Uh, the reason why we, we, we uh, have to develop is because we have to go to higher capacity, capacity mode. Uh, BRT can carry up to 20,000 uh, uh, passenger, passengers per hour per direction. The one in Bogota can actually carry up to uh, 43, uh, in a double lane, can carry up to 43,000 uh, uh, passengers per hour per direction. As you can see, the BRT in Bogota or even in uh, Guangzhou has a higher capacity than most LRT. This is the capacity of the LRT in Manila. This is the capacity of the BRT in Bogota. It's almost twice higher than the LRT in Manila. Of course, we cannot, we cannot compete with heavy rail, but we don't have heavy rail now. We cannot have heavy rail in the Philippines because the demand is not that high. This is 80,000 passengers per hour per direction. 100,000 passengers per hour per direction. This is only in Mumbai. Okay, the highest uh, rail is in Mumbai, in India. It's 100,000 uh, passengers per hour per direction. 80,000 maybe in Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, and they can reach 80,000. Hong Kong, Singapore, and Tokyo. But for our case, we only need about 13,000 to 20,000. So we are somewhere here or somewhere here. Okay, uh, this is the capacities again, again, uh, uh, you can see that uh, uh, this is this is also in terms of uh, emissions. No? Now we go back to the service plan, and that's the reason why we have the station so that we can we can attain this. We can attain the different service plans that, that has been uh, created. Now, if you look look at this, uh, these are the people that we cater to. If the, if I if I uh, go back to what I said at the earlier part of the speech. I was saying that we see this in Bulaka, we see this in Talamban mostly, and that's the reason why, that's the reason why we have this actually. Unfortunately, last year, the government has cut the BRT only from SRP up to IT Park. I really don't know the real reason why they did that, but as you can see, if we go back to our so previous slide, this is the reason why we developed the BRT because we have, we have this number of people. Take note, we go back a few slides earlier, the highest trip generation is always home to work. People get up in the morning and go to work and people from work go home in the afternoon. And where, where are our residential areas? That will be in Bulacao area and all the barangays around there. That will be in uh, Talamban area and all the barangays around there. And that's the very reason why originally the BRT was designed uh, to take care of these people from Talamban and all the people in Banilad, Bulacao, Pardo, Basak, Mambaling, uh, and of course everybody here, so that they can go to the central, central part uh, here in capital where they work here on Ayala or they work, or they can even go from Bulacao to Talamban. Um, for some reason or another, it's going to be this way, from one mall to another mall. That is the rationale that they, or they does, that is the direction that they have taken. Uh, I do not agree with this, but uh, that, that is how it's being designed now, and that's how going it's going to be implemented. Now, I think they are going to open by end of the year, uh, but the, pandi the pandemic struck, and I, I'm not sure if they can open. But they will formally open this from SM Ayala to another mall in IT Park. Cost, if you look at the cost, you, you can also see the uh, upgrade LRT is uh, 1.8 billion to 3 billion per kilometer. A mono monorail is 3 billion to 3.7 per kilometer. Elevated LRT is 3 billion to 4.5 billion per kilometer. Uh, full monorail is 5 to 7 billion per kilometer. A BRT is 180 to 800 million per kilometer. And they basically have almost the same capacity. In terms of cost, uh, these are the cost of EDSA BRT, 615 million per kilometer. Cebu is 470. Uh, the initial cost. 
These are the cost of LRT, 5.5 per kilometer, all in per kilometer. And the Mega Manila subway is 9.1 billion per kilometer. So this is just a cost comparison. Okay. So what, what we have now is uh, that's the very reason why we have the BRT and uh, I'm very glad that they are continuing it instead of stopping it. They wanted to stop it and actually uh, move that it will be scrapped back in 2017 and 2018 and NEDA did not agree. And that's the reason why I mean, was, we were very happy that it's continuing. We just hope that this can open up uh, late this year because they initially said that it will open up in December of 2020. So towards inclusive uh, mobility, we have to di diversify, we have to free and uh, diversify our streets so that we will have a very good inclusive city in our Metro Cebu. So I think I just have to end uh, here. Thank you very much and uh, uh, I'm open to answer any questions that you may have at the end of the presentation. Thank you.